One of the most unexpected things about my time in Vietnam, and indeed through uh, much of my career in the Foreign Service, was confronting life and death situations. I was only there a month or two when the first one happened. I was driving through Sedex City in my International Harvester Scout, sort of like an SUV of the 1960s, two-door, four-wheel drive vehicle, and suddenly I saw a crowd up in front of me gathering. I slowed down. Uh, our training had been, you had to watch out for something like this. Might be a trick by the Viet Cong to get you to stop, and then you could be attacked. Was this uh, an ambush, some sort of uh, trap? But I saw that people were very excited. I pulled up, and people rushed up to my car, and one young man was holding a 10-year-old boy in his arms, blood all over his stomach, his head turned, seemingly comatose, comatose or dead. And uh, they explained in Vietnamese that he had been shot in the stomach, and they were begging for help. And as uh, I pointed to the door, opened it up, they jumped in, holding the boy uh, in their lap, and I headed off into the center of the city on my way to the military hospital, which was across the Sedek River over a bridge. So at high speed, I'm driving through the marketplace. People uh, have their stalls out on the streets. They're very narrow. I'm going way faster than anyone normally would go. People are looking, shouting, gesturing, but uh, it was life and death. This boy's, uh, if he wasn't dead already, his life was uh, ebbing, flowing out onto the floor of my vehicle. As I got through the marketplace and picked up speed, I headed towards the one-lane bridge over the river. Once we made it over there, we'd be right at the hospital. I knew where it was. And as I came to the one-lane bridge, uh, in the center of it, there was a little sort of guard post. And at the top was a sign that had a red for stop and green for go. And there was an individual there who alternated uh, letting vehicles come from one side over to the other. And he'd let a few go, and then he'd let the other side come sort of like uh, when construction work's being done on a highway in America. And as I pulled up, it had just turned red, and military vehicles, big military trucks on the other side, were starting to drive up onto the bridge. They always took precedence. Uh, they were big, and everyone knew that they would go first. And I, uh, there were several of them there, a motorcade of trucks, it would take forever for them to get over. We didn't have time. And so I slammed the car, the uh, truck, uh, the SUV, into first gear, roared up onto the bridge, and started heading straight at the military truck that was just entering on the other side. My horn blaring uh, and uh, gesturing out the window. And uh, they started pulling on their horns, these loud truck horns and push, telling me, back off, back off. They're not going to back down from anybody, certainly not from a small civilian vehicle coming. But I kept going at them and uh, <clears throat> got up, up close, uh, yelling out the window in Vietnamese, uh, bitung, bitung, meaning somebody's wounded. Hopefully they're hearing me. Hopefully they're understanding what I'm saying. Eventually, I think uh, they sort of thought, this crazy guy isn't going to back off, so we're going to have to back off. And they did the unthinkable. These military trucks backed off the bridge and cleared the way. I came off, drove over to the hospital, in through the gate, up to the emergency room. All the signs are in Vietnamese. There, uh, people came out uh, to help carry this apparently lifeless boy into the emergency room. And with that, thinking I had uh, done what I could do, I turned around, I drove out, went back over to our provincial advisory team headquarters, uh, walked in, mentioned to a couple of people what I had just done, and uh, sounded like to them, like, well, just another day in Vietnam. Nobody made any special uh, fuss about it, and went about my work for the afternoon meeting and 
uh, discussing programs. Late in the afternoon, I uh, decided, well, I'd go back over and just find out what happened to the boy. So I drove back over uh, to the hospital, went to the emergency room, and walked in. And uh, one of the doctors came out who, uh, having been trained in medical school, he spoke English. Uh, and I expected to be told the boy was dead. And instead, he said words to me that I'll never forget. He said, uh, you saved his life. If uh, you hadn't gotten him here so quickly, we might not have been able to save him. And then he led me into the room, and here's this 10-year-old boy laying in a bed, surrounded by his family. They're all looking up at me. I'm looking at him. And my goodness, I was, I was so happy. Uh, that was so wonderful. So uh, I excused myself. Uh, I went out, got in my car, went back to work. So the next day, late in the afternoon, uh, I came out getting set to go back to the little hotel where uh, I was staying temporarily. And this uh, older man is standing at the front gate. He couldn't get in. There were guards and nobody could just walk in off the street. And he comes up to me, doesn't say anything, doesn't realize I can speak Vietnamese, and uh, takes me by the arm and wraps his arms around my arm and squeezes and gives me a hug. And it made such an incredible impression on me because gestures like that, even among family members, never take place in public. Uh, that was so unusual. Uh, and I would learn later, even as I learned more about the Vietnamese culture, more uh, unusual. And then he led me, and I had uh, another officer with me, uh, and I wasn't sure where we were going, but he uh, led me down to uh, the best restaurant uh, in town uh, where we had uh, a table. And usually the best restaurant would be in a building, and you'd say, oh, we're overlooking the water. Uh, this was a table and a couple of stools at the water's edge of the Sedek River. And as we're sitting there, and he ordered some uh, local Bami Ba beer, and then uh, ordered uh, chicken. At which time, just a few feet away, a chicken was brought out and unceremoniously had its head chopped off. The birds released, and in this death flutter, flies out over uh, the river, uh, not too far out. The uh, owner of the restaurant or one of the staff kind of wades in, picks up the bird, brings it out. They pluck the feathers off, cut it up, cook it. It's brought out to us as we're sitting there. All the while, this uh, man, who I learned was the father of the boy I had saved. And I tried to speak to him in Vietnamese, but he must have thought I was speaking English. And he just sat there and looked at me and smiled and as the food was brought, invited me to eat while he ate, my fellow officer ate. And there was uh, this moment where he was thanking me for saving his son's life in the way, only way he knew how. And they came from, I think, a pretty poor family, judged by how he was dressed. So I'm sure it cost maybe more than they would ever spend on dinner for themselves. But he was reaching across this cultural veil to bring home to me lessons I would learn later as a dad, that there's nothing, nothing in the world more important than the life of your children and 
the love you have for your children. And this was what his way of conveying that to me with that smile on his face, that look of gratitude for a gesture by someone who had no obligation to him, who would never have felt in their culture that you had any reason to help, but I had stepped in and done that and saved his son's life. And hugs would become a theme that I would find would run through my career. <laughs>